last thing that Dr. Marek said to me as I was coming up here to introduce her was, well, by moving down to the front row, at least there's one thing less to trip over. Well, I've already proved that it's still possible to trip over things. <laughs> However, it is a very great privilege and a great personal pleasure to introduce Dr. Marek. Um, we have somewhat similar backgrounds. We both left a cold, rainy England. She from Cambridge to go to um, San Diego. Um, and I came to North Carolina when I first came over here. And our paths crossed again um, in Rochester, New York. And I have to, of course, add New York to that title here in Minnesota, where she was on the faculty at the University of Rochester when I first joined the faculty at the University of Rochester. So it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to introduce Dr. Marek. Um, from Rochester in 1979, if I remember the date correctly, she went to Colorado, to the University of Colorado Health Science Center um, to take up a position there. And she has been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute there since 1986. Um, those of you that have read her biography in the brochure will know that it would take up most of her time speaking if I go through that. So I will just mention a few of the highlights of her achievements, um, perhaps foremost of which is the fact that she was elected several years ago to the National Academy of Science um, at a time when both young people and young women were not being elected regularly to the National Academy of Science and many of us are very proud of the fact that she was elected to the National Academy. Um, her talk this afternoon emphasizes much of the work that she has done over the years, um, and she has been, uh, you heard Dr. Manasseh this morning, while well, Dr. Marek has taken another part of the in immune system and made it understandable at a level that 10 years ago or 15 years ago we just could not have dreamed about. Um, and as a biochemist standing here, it's a particular delight to know that she's going to talk about the T-cell receptor and some of its biochemistry and immunology. So, with no further ado, I will introduce Dr. Philippa Marek and the title of her talk, T-cells and Health and Disease. Dr. Marek. wonderful to get the opportunity to talk to you all today. I think um, for two reasons, really, well, for one reason, I suppose. And that is that as a basic scientist, there are two things that, um, and I expect those of you who are scientists too know this, that there are two things that really give you pleasure in life. One of them is to go in the lab and look at this big machine and it's spitting out the results and all of a sudden you realize that you know something from the results that you never had any idea that it existed before. So you discovered something new. That's really very exciting. And then the next thing that's really, the next thing that you do under those circumstances, and it's the next thing that gives pleasure, um, is to rush out and tell everybody else what it was that you found uh, so they can all uh, share in this wonderful discovery that you've made. So I hope that um, some of you will um, follow along with what I'm talking about today and get some pleasure out of the beauty um, of the science that I'm going to talk about. Um, not because we discovered it, but because it was there already to be discovered and already very beautifully um, arranged and set up so that it, fu it functioned very well. And what I'd like to do today um, is to follow along some of the points that Dr. Banasaraf already introduced you to this morning. Um, in particular, this idea that one of the things the immune system has to do in each of us is uh, detect that foreign things have come into the body so the immune system has to be able to recognize just about all the foreign things that could enter your body um, it has to have foreknowledge of what those things might be or it has to anticipate them um, on, on the other hand simul and simultaneously the immune system must not be able to recognize any of the things that are in the body already any of self so the immune system must tell the difference between everything else and you. And if it doesn't, 
it, uh, the, the crisis will either be that it doesn't recognize anything at all and you won't be immune to anything, or the crisis will be that the body, the immune system starts to recognize self, and then we get one of this collection of autoimmune diseases that uh, Dr. Panathara mentioned earlier on, um, juvenile diabetes or uh, multiple sclerosis or um, myasthenia gravis or lupus or one of many, many diseases that some of you have probably thought about yourselves. So what I'd like to explain to you today is how the immune system does this, how it tells the difference between self and anything else. And I'd like to review um, some of the basic properties of the immune system so you can understand uh, what I'm talking about. And some of these will be uh, points that I make will be reminiscent of, of what Dr. Banasarab's already uh, mentioned, but I'd just like to remind you about, about these points. So the first thing I need to do in order to explain how we tell the difference between ourselves and everything else is to explain to you how the immune system works when it's functioning normally. Um, and they're going to have a series of cartoons here um, to help you understand this. And what you need to know is that immunity is driven by lymphocytes. These are these small little boring cells that float around in your bloodstream that everybody thought were doing absolutely nothing uh, for years and years and years. And the critical thing about lymphocytes is that they have receptors on their surface, um, not drawn to scale here. Oh, here we go. Right, this is my husband's picture. He took this picture. Um, actually, there doesn't seem to be a little red dot coming out. Um, these lymphocytes each have receptors on their surface, and we've only put one receptor on the surface, but actually there's probably about 20,000 of these things on the surface of each lymphocyte. And what this uh, diagram here illustrates is that for each lymphocyte, the receptor is slightly different. It's slightly different in amino acid sequence. It's a protein. Um, so each lymphocyte has about 20,000 of these receptors on its surface, and they differ from one lymphocyte to another. And if you can imagine the magnitude of this, uh, you and I have about uh, somewhere around a million million, 10 to the 12th or more of these lymphocytes in our bodies, and each one of them more or less has a different receptor on its surface. So we're talking about a lot of different kinds of receptors here, individually different from one cell to another. And as I expect probably many of you know, when you get an infectious agent entering the body, for example, this virus particle we've drawn here, uh, by chance, it happens to be able to bind to the receptors on some of these lymphocytes. In this case, this lymphocyte right here, it fits into the, the amino acid sequence. It's able to bind to uh, the amino acid sequence of the receptor on this lymphocyte. And the consequence of this is that this binding reaction right here between the virus and the receptor on the lymphocyte makes the lymphocyte divide. And you end up with this clonal expansion of a lymphocyte which was able to recognize this foreign invading particle, the virus particle. And what happens is that at the end of the response, we have many, many more lymphocytes bearing receptors which can deal with this virus than you had when you started with. This can be an expansion of, say, a thousand-fold in number. And that's, in fact, how you make an immune response to an antigen, a virus, or whatever. And these cells out the other end here, they're, they're what's called effector lymphocytes. They help you get rid of this virus particle in a number of ways that I don't have time to go into. Now, um, this scheme, which was for, a, for the immune response, which was devised in the 50s by um, a number of people, McFarlane Burnett, uh, Neil Sioni, and especially David Talmadge, who's in um, Denver right now, developed this theory, which is called the clonal selection theory, is the basis for how we understand immune responses to occur have lots of lymphocytes, each one has a different receptor on its surface, and the antigen pulls out the ones that can bind to and help deal with that particular antigen. It selects out the clone of cells. Now, you can see that there's a problem with this system as far as self is concerned, and that is that we believe that these lymphocytes, and we know in fact, generate receptors on their surface of random specificity. We don't know ahead of time what these receptors are going to be able to recognize. And that means that you could generate lymphocytes bearing receptors that can recognize you. And how do we deal with that problem, given that the possible outcome of recognizing you is a whole collection of potentially damaging lymphocytes that can kill your cells or create inflammatory lymphokines 
include inflammatory hormone-like molecules that could damage you. So why don't, we why don't we generate lymphocytes that bear receptors that can recognize us? And originally there were two hypotheses, basically. One possibility is that for some reason or another, we simply don't have the genes to code for the proteins, to code for the receptors that could recognize bits of us. So we're just intrinsically unable, our lymphocytes are just intrinsically unable to recognize us because we don't have the DNA to code for anti-self. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that somehow or another, the immune system learns what self looks like and deals with uh, the cells that could recognize self. So we know that we don't lack the genes, we don't lack the DNA to code for proteins that can recognize us. And the reason we know that is that my lymphocytes are very well able to reject tissue from my children Actually, they'd like to reject my children more often than not. Um, or my parents, and of course my children's lymphocytes, and my children are only too eager to reject me, conversely. Um, so, and we know that we all share genes with each other, so uh, it would be almost impossible, since I reject my lymphocytes, would reject my close relatives' tissues so effectively. It's almost impossible to imagine that genetically I lack the ability to recognize myself where I can certainly recognize my mother and my kids and so on very well. So this is sort of ruled out um, by that kind of reasoning, the possibility that we lack the. But there's actually another, uh, of course, some very beautiful sets of experiments which tell us that the way we distinguish ourselves from everything else is because we learn to do that. And the first experiment um, that was done to prove this was done by Ray Owen in 1945, which was the year I was born, actually. Um, and what he showed was that if you have brothers and sisters, calves who, now we're talking about cows, calves who are brothers and sisters, normally they can reject skin grafts between each other very well. But if they happen to have come out of the same pregnancy and they shared a placenta, which that happens sometimes for calves, um, they won't reject skin grafts one from the other. The two twins don't reject skin grafts. So somehow in utero, the two calves learned that the other, or at least they thought they learned, that the other one was self too, and their immune system won't reject the other calf anymore. Um, so we know that tolerance to self, it's called tolerance, the lack of ability to recognize self is something that your immune system learns. Now, what I'd like to tell you about today is how the immune system learns what self is, because it's actually a very simple and straightforward message, as you'll see, and quite clever. Um, the way biology has set this up. But I have to tell you a little bit about the receptors on cells before um, I do that. And the first thing I'd like to introduce is to r remind you of something that Dr. Vanasarov told you earlier on today. And that is that the immune system, in fact, actually has um, three different kinds of receptors, three different kinds of lymphocytes. And each lymphocyte bears an entirely different type of receptor for antigen on its surface. So we have in us, as human beings, about a million million B cells, and each B cell has on its surface a slightly different version of this molecule, which is an immunoglobulin molecule. It's, uh, it's an antibody molecule, very similar to the kind of antibodies that you have floating around in your serum. So B cells bear immunoglobulins. And then we have these two different kinds of T cells. This kind over here, the gamma delta cell, which I don't understand, so I'm not going to talk about that. And then. This T cell here, the alpha beta T cell, which was the kind of T cell that Dr. Banasarov was talking about, and it's the cell that I'm going to discuss today as well. Included in this group of T cells are the CD4 bearing cells, the ones that I think uh, Dr. Gallo might discuss a little bit later on when he talks about AIDS infections, because uh, it, the target of the HIV, of the immunodeficiency virus, is a kind of this type of T cell, an alpha beta bearing cell. But what I'm going to say about alpha beta T cells applies to some extent or another also to B cells. And I haven't any idea whether it applies to gamma delta cells, so we won't worry about them. Now I need to tell you a little bit about the T cell receptor, the alpha beta receptor and how it works. Um, the alpha beta receptor on T cells, the question is how do you get all these millions and millions of different, slightly different specificities out of these receptors? How do you construct a receptor which on one cell has a particular amino acid sequence, a particular structure, 
and on another T cell is similar but not identical. How is that done? And it's, the way it's done, it's done uh, genetically in a rather complicated way that I don't want to go into, but basically it's done in a, in a similar manner to a kind of a cheap Chinese restaurant. And what that means is, you know, when you go to, I don't know if this happens in the States so much, but when you go to a cheap Chinese restaurant, they say you should take, choose one possibility out of this collection of A things, like spare ribs or whatever, and then one, you can choose one thing out of column B, et cetera, et cetera, and put together your dinner by combinations from dis different lists. And that's basically what the T cell does. It can choose, uh, for the alpha chain, it can choose um, a V, it's called V alpha, out of a pool of about 50 or 60 different V alphas, it can choose just one. And then it can choose a J alpha, and there are about 50 different J alphas, and it can choose just one of the 50. And then there's this thing called N, which I don't want to talk about too much, but there's about 400 different choices for N. So a T cell is choosing, is making its alpha chain out of one of 50, and one of 50, and one of 400, and if you multiply that together, the number of possible ways of putting an alpha chain together is very large. So it has, just like you could put your Chinese dinner together in a lot of different combinations, the T cell does the same thing for its alpha chain. And likewise for its beta chain, it puts it together in a lot of different combinations, and in fact, this is a sort of a ballpark figure. It's plus or minus two orders of magnitude right. There are probably around 10 to the 14th different ways that we could assemble a T cell receptor. So that's why I say out of the million, million T cells we have, probably none of them have exactly the same receptor. They've all made slightly different choices. So I hope I made that clear. The, the diversity of the receptor is put together by choosing one of many combinations, one of many possibilities at each of these positions. So that's the first point I want to make about the T cell receptor, that it's put together with these little segments, each of which is different from one cell to another. And then the other thing I need to tell you about the receptor, and this is something that Dr. Banasraf pointed out before, is that the job, here's the T cell up here, see it's something huge right up here, and the way the T cell receptor works is it sees little fragments of antigen, little peptide fragments of antigen, bound in the groove that Dr. Banasraf shows you. Uh, of the major histocompatibility complex molecule. These are proteins that are on every surf the surface of uh, many cells in the body. And the way we've drawn this, you can see here's the surface of the T cell receptor made up of all these segments that I said the T cell had a choice about. And all of these segments contribute to the ability of the T cell up here to bind to this little antigenic fragment, a little chunk of flu virus or polio virus or whatever it is, are bound in the groove right here. So the point is that for most antigens, um, flu or polio or chickenpox or tuberculosis or whatever, ragweed, um, the T cell has to have exactly the right combination. It has to have chosen the right V alpha and the right V beta and the right J beta and so on in order to be able to recognize that peptide. So if you remember, I told you there were lots and lots of different specificities. What this means is, is that in an unprimed in animal, in a normal individual who hasn't had this particular chickenpox virus before, for example, the frequency of responding T cells is very, very low. It's something like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand T cells is able to recognize that virus. Likewise, for your own peptides, for example, for a peptide from your big toe or whatever it is, we imagine that the frequency of T cells, if you hadn't already been uh, immunized with that big toe antigen, would be very, very rare, one in 10 to the fifth or so. What that means is it's tremendously difficult to figure out what's happened to that T cell. If you made a T cell that could recognize an antigen in your big toe, how could we figure out what it was doing? Was it there, was it present or not? Um, is it in the body, or is it just sort of sitting around ignoring your big toe? Because it's so rare in the population, we can't tell which T cell to look at. So the question is, how do we devise a tool so that we can follow what happens to T cells that can recognize ourselves? And uh, a few years ago, John Kapler and I happened on a tool, it was a complete accident, um, that turned out to be very useful. And this was a special kind of antigen we discovered. It's called a superantigen. And you can see that regular bits of uh, flu or TB or whatever antigen it is that's entered the body, the foreign substance, usually lie in this special little groove here. 
But th these super antigens that we discovered have a totally different way of interacting with the T cell receptor. They bind onto these peculiar molecules, these MHC molecules right here, and they clamp the whole thing up the side by binding to a piece of the T cell receptor called V beta. And they don't care about all these other variable bits. They're only interested in this one little bit called V beta. Now, in human beings, we have about 50 different V beta genes, 50 or 60 different V beta genes altogether. What that means is that about 2% of our T cells, or more in fact, can be recognize, can recognize a superantigen because they have the right V beta on their surface, the superantigen will grab them. And so, in man, we can follow very easily um, the ability of a super, the interaction of a superantigen with a T cell because it's easy to see what 2% of T cells are doing, or at least it's tremendously easier to see what 2% of the cells are doing than one in a million cells is doing, if you see what I mean. And fortunately for us, over the years, people have made antibodies against these Vs, these different V betas, and so we can actually follow T cells bearing particular V betas by seeing whether they react with antibodies. That may seem a little complex, but actually, I have to tell you that technically, it's much, much easier to do than it was before. And I didn't tell you this, but in mice, which is the animal we work with most of the time, uh, because we can't usually get human beings to volunteer to get immunized with these, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, in mice, um, there are only about 20 V betas, so that means that 5% of the T cells in a, mice, in a mouse bear any given V beta or thereabouts. And that's a piece of cake to see by comparison with one in a million cells. So you'll see the kind of experiment that we can do with this very useful uh, reagents in a minute. I thought I'd tell you just a few things about superantigens before we go any further. Um, the first thing is, is that they have to bind to these MHC molecules, um, which I don't want to go into in any depth uh, right now. And the second is just to remind you once again that the way these special antigens react with T cells is just through that special part of the receptor called V beta. And now I need to tell you what superantigens are. Um, and some of them, in fact, everybody in this audience has met a superantigen, I'll guarantee you, because um, they are made by bacteria, a cold collection of made by streptococci and staphylococci, and they are the major cause of food poisoning in this country. A staphylococcal enterotoxin B, for example, was first worked on um, in um, Madison and sequenced in Madison. It's a fairly medium-sized protein. It's the kind of protein that when you eat an egg salad that's been sitting out too long, makes you feel really bad for a short space of time, for about a day. It's that kind of food poisoning I'm talking about now. And we think, in fact, that the food poisoning has something to do with the fact that these toxins engage T cells, and maybe I'll come back to that later on. Anyway, uh, so staphylococci make about 11 or 12 different toxins which are superantigens. One of them is the toxic shock toxin, which uh, gained some notoriety in the early 80s uh, when rely tampons were brought in. Um, it was the cause of a considerable amount of toxic shock, an epidemic of toxic shock in this country. Um, and the other point I want to make about these particular kind of toxins is that they have specificities for different VBs. And in order to explain that, I have to say that, if you remember, I told you that the T cell has a choice of one out of 20 VBs or whatever it is. Each VB is different in sequence, and the scientists who study them have numbered them. Uh, so in mice, we have VB is 1 through 19. And each number designates a slightly different amino acid sequence, slightly different structure for that VB. So staphylococcal enterotoxin B, for example, reacts with T cells in mouse bearing VB to 7 um, and the members of the 8 family. And in man, if you were to eat staph enterotoxin B, the T cells in you that would get all upset about this would be uh, those bearing VB to 3, 12, etc., etc. Whereas in, in mice, for example, another staphylococcal enterotoxin called SEA engages T cells bearing VB to, mouse VB to 3. Now, it's not only bacteria that make superantigens, there's also a collection of viruses that make superantigens. And uh, the most well-known of those are some viruses in mice which, call bre which cause breast cancer. They're called mouse, mam mouse mammary tumor viruses, MTV. And uh, one of the viruses that I'm going to mention later on is a virus that's passed through the mother's milk from the lactating mother to her baby in the milk. And this 
virus carries with it a superantigen which um, engages T cells in mice bearing V beta 14. But these mouse mammary tumor viruses are especially interesting because over the course of the years, some of these viruses have picked themselves up and put themselves into the DNA of the mouse themselves. They've what's called integrated themselves. So there are mice running around in your backyards which have integrated into their own DNA some of these mammary tumor viruses, and they carry with them superantigens. So as far as these mice in your backyards are concerned, the virus in their DNA is them. They can't tell the difference between the virus and themselves because they grow up with it. It's in their DNA just like anything else that's in their DNA. So we can use these viruses that are making superantigens that are actually in the mouse DNA itself to study what happens when a mouse T cell develops and sees a superantigen which is specific for that T cell. Now I'll try and illustrate that on the next slide. First of all, I want to tell you the people who did the work I'm going to talk about today is John Kapler and myself. We run a lab together, and our postdocs who were involved in this work were Yong Won Choi and Terry Finkel and Leszek Ignatowicz and Jim McCormick. And uh, some of the work I'm going to talk about was in collaboration with Brian Kotzen, if I have enough time. And another postdoc who mysteriously didn't show up on this slide, whose name is Xavier Palliard. So, how do we tell the difference between ourselves and everything else, given that we could make lymphocytes that could recognize us? So basically, over the years, there are three theories that have come forward to account for tolerance to self. And they are, one possibility is that uh, T cells, while they're developing, go through a stage where if their receptors get engaged by something, that cell will die. And since self is always present, when T cells are developing, self is always present, um, all T cells while, during development will go through this screen of whether or not they can react with self. And if the clonal elimination theory, the clonal deletion occurs, they will die during that developmental stage. I don't know if I said that clearly enough, but I'll say it again later on. Another possibility is that contact with self during this sensitive developmental stage will cause the cell not to die, but simply to become inactivated. So it'll still sit around, but it, it won't actually die, but it won't be able to do anything threatening to the host anymore because it's inactivated by this contact um, during an early developmental stage. And another possibility that's been suggested is that somehow or another, potentially autoreactive T cells are kept at bay by other cells that keep them um, under control, called suppressor cells. So what I'd first like to show you is some evidence that at least for many self-antigens, this first mechanism, clonal deletion, is a very important one in maintaining self-tolerance. In order to do this, I first have to explain to you how T cells develop. Um, T cells are formed in the thymus, this gland right here um, in your chest. And they go through, a, the cells enter the thymus from the bone marrow or the yolk sac or fetal liver. And at that point, they don't have any receptors on their surface at all. And when they get to the thymus, the environment of the thymus induces the appearance of receptors, each different on one T cell from another um, on the surface of these cells. And then um, they go through three or four days of uh, stage here, which doesn't have very much receptor on its surface. It's called an immature thymocyte. And then the cells uh, go through a process that Dr. Bonasaraf alluded to called positive selection that I won't discuss and they turn into mature lymphocytes, first in the thymus, medulla, right here, and later on in the periphery in the spleens and lymph nodes uh, and peripheral blood of the animal. So the T cell develops in the thymus, and it goes through an immature phase in the thymus. So, now this is a complicated slide to explain. Uh, what we have on this axis is the percent, uh, what we can do is look in individual mice and ask how many cells do they have, how many T cells do they have, which have on their surfaces, for example, this V beta, V beta 6. And in a normal animal, it's around about 12% of all the T cells bear uh, V beta 6 on their surface. Now, some mice are infected, um, not are infected, 
have in their DNA, integrated into their DNA, one of these mammary tumor viruses I told you about that makes a superantigen which can react with T cells bearing VB to 6. So that, the T cells in that animal are growing up in the constant environment of this mammary tumor virus, uh, making uh, a superantigen specific for VB to 6. And we can ask what percentage of the T cells in that animal bear VB to 6. And the answer is it's much less than the expected percentage. Instead of 12%, which is what we've called 100% right here, it's a very confusing picture, instead of 12%, it's less than 1%. So, uh, and this is, we're looking at the periphery of the animal now in the lymph nodes and spleen. So the, the expression of this superantigen, uh, that as far as the mouse is concerned, is self, in the animal has caused the disappearance of all the T cells or most of the T cells bearing VB to 6 in that animal. Now, when did that happen? Did it happen when the T cells got to the periphery or did it happen in the thymus? And this is a slide that shows you that it happened in the thymus. If you could just follow along here, this is the mice. These are mice which have that MTV that encodes a VB to 6 a reactive superantigen. You can see they have a very low percentage of their mature thymocytes um, bearing this antigen, uh, bearing VB to 6. And they have a reduced, a less than expected number of the immature thymocytes bearing um, this VB to. So the summary of this kind of experiment is that um, thymocytes do indeed go through a stage right here while they're immature, about halfway through their immature phase, uh, the, the point of this red line right here, in which they become sensitive to deletion. And if their receptors at that time become engaged with something that can react with those receptors, that is a signal for death of those cytomocytes. And therefore, those particular cells, because they're dead, can no longer proceed through to the mature thymocyte stage and to the periphery. And we see this as a deletion of that particular subset of cells. So in this particular case, self has caused clonal deletion of potentially reactive um, T cells in the thymus. So just to summarize what I've told you so far and to make sure to really ram this point through, uh, what these experiments have shown is that during their development, T cells go through a stage when if their receptors bind antigen, bind something, those cells will die. Because our self is always there, self is always present, all developing cells as they go through this kind of adolescent rebellious stage will get checked out for their ability to be killed um, by antigen, by self. And if they, their receptors react with self, those cells will die. And the critical point is that infectious things from the outside, like, for example, polio virus, are not always present in the body. The child is born without, not infected with polio virus, and therefore, during the early stages of that child's life, its thymus will produce T cells that can react with polio virus antigens. Later on, when the child becomes confronted with polio vaccine, I hope, or polio virus, perhaps, um, those T cells that are now already mature can help respond to and get rid of the virus as I showed you on a much earlier slide. At the same time, of course, the T cells which are developing right at that very moment now think the polio virus is self because it's in the body at the very time that those particular cells are developing and they'll die. But it doesn't matter because by that time the child has already accumulated enough T cells, mature T cells, to help get rid of the virus. So that's the theory to account for the data that I've just shown for you, that I've just shown you um, about clonal deletion and I have sort of some sort of hysterical slides. Right. Now, um, it is possible that not all antigens get into the thymus. For example, you could imagine that things that were in your big toe, how would they ever get to the thymus? Well, some of them do get carried back to the thymus on the surface of macrophages or whatever, or B cells or something. Um, and, and may be able to tolerate T cells there, but perhaps there are some kinds of antigens that don't get carried back very well to the thymus, and how do we keep our lymphocytes tolerant to those? And especially critical in this regard are various antigens that are in your brain or perhaps in your joints. And I should tell you at this point that it's not clear that we are in fact tolerant to the antigens that are in our brain. But I'd like to deal with a few more um, antigens that are elsewhere in the body uh, first.
And so, um, because we now have these tools, the superantigens, to help us in our experiments, I'd like to illustrate this question of peripheral tolerance, how we become tolerant to antigens outside the thymus, with a couple of experiments here. Now, in this case, we've taken a mouse and injected an adult mouse and injected it with one of those bacterial superantigens. This is SEA, which, if you remember in mice, stimulates T cells um, bearing VB to 3. So we injected the mouse with SEA right here on day zero, and then we asked what percentage of T cells in the lymph node and spleen uh, have on their surface this VB to 3 with which SEA can react. And what you see is there's a big spike as the lymphocytes proliferate in response to this antigen in number, and then they fall off. In fact, they, a fair number of them die and disappear. And we're left with some cells left over at the end here, which is somewhat less than we started with. So an acute confrontation with antigen goes almost pretty much as you would have predicted. You see a response as the lymphocytes divide, and then they die away. But if we put the antigen in chronically, that is sort of every other day, pretending as, as though it was an antigen in your big toe and you kept on challenging lymphocytes with it, what we see is that uh, if we put in a lot of it, there's a spike of response. But if we put in just a little antigen, the lymphocytes just disappear. The VB to 3 bearing cells just disappear and eventually dwindle away to nothing. So there's some kind of mechanism whereby a chronic antigen, which is what self is, causes the disappearance of target cells in the periphery. And I have to tell you now, we have no idea what this mechanism is, and we certainly would like to know what it is, because you could imagine the therapeutic value of understanding this mechanism in autoimmune diseases. If we knew what the antigen was, and we knew how to get this chronic disappearance business to work, we perhaps could deal with autoimmunity much more effectively than we do right now. So the immune system, once again, is dealing with potentially autoimmune T cells on the basis that the antigen is being continuously administered to them. And as I said, we don't understand what this phenomenon is, but it looks like something real, um, if, and we wish that we understood it better than we do. Um, I'd like to point out one other thing about this mechanism, and this is a little difficult to grasp from this slide, so I'll just tell you, and that is that we can interfere with that disappearance in response to peripheral antigens if we put in an inflammatory agent at the same time. So we're chronically giving this mouse uh, staphylococcal enterotoxin A, for example, and making the T cells bearing VB to 3 disappear, and if at the same time we give the mouse some kind of really strong stimulus, an inflammatory stimulus, in this case, an adjuvant called complete Freund's adjuvant, they don't disappear after all. So maybe that's another phenomenon that has something bearing on autoimmune diseases and how they start. So to uh, summarize what I've told you so far, um, acute exposure to superantigens of peripheral mature T cells causes them to expand and then disappear a little bit, and if we expose mature T cells chronically to a superantigen and presumably a regular antigen too, um, this causes them to die. And in an inflammatory process such as complete Freund's adjuvant, an, an inflammatory agent can interfere with this deletion and we are thinking along the lines that some phenomenon like this or related to this may have some bearing on uh, the induction of autoimmunity in patients. Now I don't think I have time to show you this so I'll skip it and just come to the summary. And that is that what I didn't have time to show you is that under some special circumstances, instead of getting deleted, T cells can get inactivated. So basically, uh, what I've described so far is this mechanism of clonal deletion ad nauseam in the thymus or in the periphery, self can cause the disappearance of target cells. And also, under certain circumstances, um, self can, instead of causing these target cells to disappear, can just make them inactive. And what I haven't discussed with you is this third mechanism um, of suppression, and I'm not going to do that um, today. What I wanted to finish up with very briefly um, is some description of how this is relevant to disease in man. And what I'm going to show you is very hypothetical. They're real data, but the explanation of the data is pretty hypothetical, as you will see. And a little complicated, so I hope you'll follow along with the results. <laughs>
Now, if you remember, in man, I told you, there are about 60 different V-betas, and each T-cell bears a different V-beta. Um, in this assay that I'm showing here, we only actually measured 20 of them, or families of 20 of them. So what's shown on this slide is the percentage of T-cells in two individuals that bear different V-betas on their surface. So, for example, you can see that both of these individuals have a fair number of T cells bearing VB to 13.1, which is just a name for an amino acid sequence um, on their surface. So this is a commonly used VB to by these two people and by most of the people in this audience. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple of things of this about this of general interest. The VB to's are not sort of equally often used. Some of them are used very frequently, like this 13.1 by T cells, and some of them are hardly ever used, like we. None of us have any T cells, hardly at all, bearing VB to 10. And I don't know why it should be such a poor despised relative, but it just isn't often used. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that these two individuals are not identical. For example, the dark one, the dark person right here, has hardly any T cells bearing VB to 3. And the hatched person here, uh, who's me, who's infinitely superior, has many more T cells bearing VB to 3 um, in her circulation. And we don't know what, the, what caused that. We don't know the significance of that. It's just a fact right now. Uh, that, and the scientific and medical consequences of that we don't understand. Now, what I wanted to show you here is a patient. This is some experiments that uh, Xavier Palliard, a postdoc in our lab, and Brian Cotson published about a year ago to dealing with the T cell repertoire in people with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease of the joints, as I expect some of you know. Um, and he, Xavier, was trying to figure out whether there was anything peculiar about T cell receptors, um, about the T cells in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So what he did was he collected the T cells from the peripheral blood and the synovial fluids, that is the rheumatic joints of patients, uh, of the same patient, and compared what kind of T cell was in the peripheral blood to the kind of T cell that was in the synovial fluid. And in the dark bars, um, the dark bars show the percentage of T cells bearing different V beaters um, in the peripheral blood. Again, he was looking at V beaters 1 through 20. And the hatched bars show the same V beaters measured in the synovial fluid, the percentage of T cells bearing them. And what you can see is that on the whole, things are rather similar, except at V beta 14. Um, where there's definitely a lot more T cells in the synovial fluid than there are in the peripheral blood bearing this V beta. And um, this wasn't true simply for this one patient. It was true for every patient we looked at. This is a collection of room patients with rheumatoid arthritis right here. The dark bars in every case of their peripheral blood and the hatched bars is what's happening um, in their synovial fluid. And you can see for all of these, there are more V beta 14s in the synovial fluid than in the peripheral blood. Here are some control patients who had a different kind of arthritis in their joints, not rheumatoid. And here are a collection of individuals who didn't have arthritis. And we can't look at the T cells in their synovial fluid because first of all, it's not ethical to go sucking things out of people's knees if they don't have something wrong with them. And secondly, they don't have any, if you're a healthy individual, you don't have any T cells in your knees anyway. So that was a good reason not to do it, apart from the ethical considerations right there. But actually, the point I really want you to notice from this slide is not the difference between the synovial fluid and the peripheral blood, but the fact that some of these patients with arthritis had no detectable T cells bearing VB to 14 in their peripheral blood at all. It was like they were all gone. And that wasn't true for any of the normal controls that we looked at. So there was something about this disease that was removing the T cells bearing VB to 14 um, from the blood. Um, and one explanation for this is that um, there's a superantigen specific for VB to 14 sitting in the joints of these patients that's sort of sucking all the VB to 14 into the joints, all the VB to 14 pairings, T cells into the joints. So there's nothing in the peripheral blood, they're all in the joints. Well, let me tell you, there isn't enough room in your knees for all the VB to 14 bearing cells you have in your body, so they simply wouldn't fit. So that's probably not the explanation, and in fact, I don't have time to go into it. We, we know that that's not true. It's not that there's a superantigen in the joints attracting all the T cells in there. What the disease looks much more like 
what the phenomenon looks much more like is the expression of some sort of chronic superantigen in these patients' bodies, which has caused deletion. Remember I told you that chronic expression of antigen causes deletion of peripheral T cells? So it's called all the VB to 14 cells in the periphery of these patients to disappear, and the only ones that are left behind are a few that could be rescued because they're sort of hidden in the joints and responding to antigen in the joints. So I've written the theory down on this slide, I think. Yeah, here we go. This is such an exciting way to show the slide. What this slide is going to show you is the hypothesis we developed to account for the fact that some arthritis patients don't have any T cells bearing this particular V beta in their joints. And um, the, theory goes, the theory goes like this, that these people are wandering around fairly normal. They have a few T cells in them already that have snuck through all these processes of tolerance that I told you about. So they just didn't see joint antigen in their thymus and the joints are all nicely encapsulated so they never see the antigens, the collagen or whatever it is that's in the joints um, in their periphery. So a few T cells go through the thymus, they mature and they come out and potentially these T cells could react with that individual's collagen antigens, for example, joint antigens, um, if they ever saw them. But because they're never exposed to the joint, um, they never do anything much, and they're not activated, they're not excited about anything, they're not doing anything. Then one day this individual catches something that chronically expresses a superantigen specific for VB to 14, and this causes the activation of all the VB to 14 cells in this individual. And one of the things that happens when T cells become activated is they become much more mobile, and they can travel around better. So the theory goes that these T cells can sort of, some of the mobile ones, go through the joints, and the VB to 14 cells that could recognize joint antigens stay there and initiate the process of disease, the process of rheumatoid arthritis in the joints. Meanwhile, the chronic expression of this VB to 14 specific superantigen deletes all the T cells everywhere else in the body because it's there for such a long time, and they, the T cells begin to think that the superantigen is self. Um, if we could skip that slide and just... Oh. Do I get extra minutes for this? I reckon. Um, so here's the theory. I, I don't want to go through it again. You, you heard it. The, these people who are... Rheumatoid arthritis is an MHC-linked disease in, in uh, this country. It's linked to DRF, to expression of an, of an MHC antigen, an uh, MHC protein called DR4. All those individuals I showed you, in fact, were positive for the DR4 MHC type. So what we're saying is in some people who are DR4 positive, these T cells sneak through tolerance somehow or another. And they sit around and don't do any damage. All of a sudden, the individual becomes invaded by an exogenous antigen, a superantigen that's specific for VB to 14. It activates the cells. The joint-specific VB to 14-bearing cells whiz off to the joints and start to cause the disease, rheumatoid arthritis. Meanwhile, in the periphery, the rest of the cells become um, deleted, and then other T cells join the VB14 bearing cells in the joint, and you eventually develop the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. This is very hypothetical and almost certainly not right, but it's a sort of idea on which I don't mean to belittle it, but what I mean is that you're never right the first time, but you sort of approach rightness gradually. So this is a sort of a, a hint about how these diseases might start. It's not the absolute answer, but it's the kind of thing that makes you feel as though you have your foot in the door and you can start prizing the door open a bit more and maybe see more glimmerings of the truth as you get further inside. But what I wanted to finish off with is the last slide which describes how the immune system tells the difference between self and everything else because this is the absolute critical feature that I wanted you to take home with yourself, with you. And that is we tell ourselves from everything else because we are always there and the infectious agents are only there some of the time and that is the critical element which defines self from non-self. Thank you very much.